Say with me, say with me, uh, say with me, one is a devil. We decided to, 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 uh, to title it that. But listen, I want, I want you to, why did I carry on? I'm not going to get onto the stage unless the presence is tangible. Are you with me? And uh, I, you know, I don't know, my brother, I don't know why the thing is so soft. I don't know if it is you that is playing soft. It is the sound. Is it the, what is going on? Hey? Whoever, what is happening? Somebody needs to give me answers because I see it goes off and then on and off and on. And I don't know if it is him or if it is you guys because you guys keep telling me it is him in the week. When I get here, then people saying it is the sound. So I need to hear sound. Okay. Somebody's affecting the sound and it is, it is very demonic. It's very demonic, whether it is you or whether it is not. I'm not here to blame. I'm not saying, uh, uh, but I will offend everyone tonight so that the devil can manifest. So I'm okay with it. I really couldn't care two cents. If um, I cannot hear, and they keep saying we need new equipment and we buy new equipment and we need new equipment. I mean, how much more equipment do we need? Something's wrong that I can't hear the piano. So between the two of you, please sort out, because now I can hear it. Now since I asked it, I could hear it. So if, if you, are, you should be playing full notes, you guys should learn how to flow in the Holy Spirit. And I will push the band and people can say, but you know, I didn't come to hear Leon fighting with a band. It is okay. This is where they train as well. But they need to uh, learn how to open up or let the river flow. Because if people cannot let the river flow, something is wrong. Uh, it means that the inner room relationship is not so good. Because the rivers flow where there is no blockage. Oh, now you've gone silent. Even when you worship, if there's blockages which is offense, you're unable to, to, to worship and bring Him in. But when you are free, you are able to worship Him. There's no blockages. Why are we preaching on offense? So that people can be set free. Are you guys with me? And trust me, when people walk in offense, they become demonized. At the seventh stage, if you were here this morning, when demonization takes place, it means a demon has entered, or say, the Bible says Satan has entered. I've seen it happen to leaders around me. I've seen it happen to many people. And then they are blinded to know what is going on. And it takes somebody to be able to see it and say, we need to remove this blockage so that God can flow again. Are you guys with me? Please stay with me and don't get offended, even though you're going to get offended. So, Jesus said these words. He says, I have chosen 12 of you. John 16 verse 70, put it on the, on the John 6 verse 70, put it on the screen, John 6 verse 70. I have chosen one of you. I have chosen 12 of you. Jesus answered them, have I not chosen you 12? Say with me, and. It doesn't say but, it says and. I want you to really consider and listen to this. He says, and one of you is a devil, not but one of you is a devil. If Jesus would have said but, it means that God was a mistake, meaning that Jesus made a mistake. He said, I chose 12 of you, but one is a devil. No, 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 no. He changed the wording very specific. He said, I chose 12 of you, and one is a devil. Sure. What does and mean? It means I chose 12 even though I knew that one is a devil. Not I chose 12 and then one turned out to be a devil. Are you guys with me? And means there must be one amongst you. Meaning Satan was looking by whom he could enter into. First he tried Peter. Are you guys with me? And when he couldn't get into Peter, Jesus was walking and he said, Satan, get behind me. When Peter said, Lord, it is not good for you to go to the cross. He said, get behind me, Satan. I don't know if you guys are with me. And he caused Peter, and Peter somehow dealt with his heart. And then the devil was looking for another loophole in. And he found a person called Judas. 
And when he found Judas, we see a procedure beginning to take place. We see things beginning to unravel. Where Jesus warned him once, warned him twice, warned him three times. And Judas had the opportunity to choose not to become a Judas. Are you guys with me? Which means that if he chose not to, the devil would have found another way. But he didn't listen to a prophetic warning. Jesus gave him a prophecy. And he went because pride has already settled in. It has blinded him to the words. He was too close to Jesus. I'm going to say it again. He was too close. So when you are too close, familiarity sets in. When a person is too close, I'm not saying everyone. I'm just saying we fall into the trap of being prone to weakness, to blindness. So if you're prone to blindness. So when I'm too close to the anointing, I can either excel or I become prone to blindness. I can no longer see my own sin. And my own mouth will set my own demise. The Bible says that, uh, get me the verse where it says the decree of the watchers um, in Daniel. Just Google for me the decree of the watchers and give me that verse. I want to read to you something. And I'm preaching this tonight because this morning we spoke about the stages of uh, we spoke about the stages of offense. So tonight we want to deal with offense. Is that okay? And break the thing. Daniel what? Daniel 4 verse 17. Let me just look for something here. Just want to see if I can find it or not. Let me just. What I'm looking for. Let me see if I can, uh, if I can find it. Get me, sorry about this, get me the... Maybe it is this one. Yes, I think it's here. Yes, so D Daniel 4 verse 17. And then we'll jump to this. Let me read here for you first. Daniel 4 verse 17. It's speaking of Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. And he was basically dreaming of his own demise. Are you guys with me? What happened with the lights? Okay, so Daniel 4 17. So listen to this. This matter... Let me read in the New King James. Uh, New King James. Put it in the New King James. The, this decision is by the decree of the watchers and the sentence by the word of the holy ones. In order that the living may know that the most high rules in the kingdom of men, gives it to whomever he will and sets it over the lowest of men. Then it goes on and says, This dream I, Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now you, Balthazar, Daniel, declare its interpretation since all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known to me the interpretation but you are able for the spirit of the holy God is in you but verse 17 it says, it says this decision is by the decree of the watchers say with me, by the decree of the watchers so I want you to understand this, that first something was decreed in heaven now there is, say with me one of us is a devil okay, one, one of us is a devil, okay and uh Tonight, maybe we deal with it. Maybe in the next two weeks. Um, uh, 
uh, uh, uh, uh, but those that need freedom in this area will get freedom. Those that have too much pride. Now listen to this. It says, by the decree of the watchers, by the decree of the watchers, meaning something was already established in heaven. Something was already established in heaven, but it needed a word of agreement on the earth. So by two or three witnesses, so it shall be and so it shall be established. But heaven and earth needs to agree. So the heaven and earth must agree. So why do I, you see, why did Judas become offended? Now I'm going to get into that thing now of where we were reading just now, uh, the decree of the watchers. Why was Judas offended? Judas was offended because he became familiar. Very simple. At the moment he became familiar. Familiarity isn't, isn't, um, familiarity is a, is a attitude of the heart. The same way honor is an attitude of the heart. You can feel, let me say this, I'm going to, are we busy writing a book? And it's, it's basically done. We're just looking for editors. So if somebody's a professional editor, please not a wannabe editor, a professional, I had a lot of wannabe editors, edit, you know, messaging me, hey, uh, I can edit your book. Uh, no, we're looking for professional editors to edit a book. I understand the ambition, but uh, unless somebody is a professional editor, but we have written a book on the prophetic that um, I have basically put all the things that I've taught very specifically on the prophetic in. And um, one of them is how to receive a prophet. So it's about a 200 page book. It's going to be an excellent book and I want to see how quickly we can release it. But it is how to receive a prophet. There's a language on how to receive a prophet. Do you know why there is so little prophets in South Africa? And yes, I say little, even though I'll get attacked on, 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 on live stream because of familiarity. So Africa, South Africa has kicked out her own prophets. Or let me rather change the wording and not say South Africa. Let me say, why are there so little prophets amongst the white crowd? Because the white crowd comes to you and uh, walks up to you and say, calls you by your first name and say, oh, what is God saying to me? Uh, absolutely nothing. And even if he is, I am not saying anything. The gift is not stirred. They don't know how to receive a prophet. A prophet and the prophetic gift has principles and protocols on how to step in. Otherwise, you can sit next to somebody that might release to you your destiny. And because of an attitude, you just cannot, they cannot release it to you. Does this not mean no? So, so this is what is happening with people that are proud for, oh, God is the one who has my calling. No, absolutely not. God has put your calling into men so that we can need one another. There's no such thing as God, as like, you know, God will take me in my calling. Go pray and let's see. I'll see you when you're 70, if you're still alive. God created men to carry your calling and your destiny like this. They are the key for you to enter into the call that God has for your life. So that the body of Christ knitted together, every joint can supply one another. Are you guys with me? And that we can give the supply of Jesus Christ to one another. The eye cannot say I am the foot and cannot do without the foot. And the foot cannot do without the eye. But they need one another. So God has put the fivefold giftings, but also giftings in the body of Christ. Gifts that every single one of us carry. Gifts and callings that every single one of us carries so that we can need one another. So because if I am everything, if I need, if I have, uh, uh, how can I say it? If, if I don't need anybody else and it's all God doing it for me, then why is nothing happening in my life? Yet some person can come and just take a key and unlock it. 
But the thing is, a lot of people are close to the anointing without knowing how to receive from the anointing or the prophetic. And they can be closer to the anointing than others. And 15 years stay in the same place and never enter what God has for them because they don't know how to receive and they've allowed offenses to come in. And because offenses has come in, the serpentine nature is beginning to come forth. So it is always the mouth that is running. Is this too much of a, of a heavy message? So if the Lord heard it. Uh-huh. The Bible says, Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses. And the Lord heard it. You know, there's one thing you can lie to a lot of people, but you can never lie to God. And promotion doesn't come from man. Promotion comes from God. Promotion doesn't come from the east or the west or the south, but promotion comes from the north. Now, I'm very sorry if this is heavy for you, but we're going to get into good, don't worry, we're going to get into some good revelation. But uh, we are not living a word. We are not AFM. But we deal with it prophetically, and you will learn a lot more here than at any other church. And I dare to say that. <laughs> okay. So, you'll get much more revelation here. I can guarantee you that. Prophetic revelation. I'm sure other churches have revelation in other areas and have, other, and have strong points in many other areas. Whether it's evangelism and this, but when it comes to prophetic revelation and revelation of the word, uh, it is encountered as unmatched. And that I can guarantee you. I can guarantee. Why? Because I find many preaching my messages... They're way bigger than us. And, the, and it's, not, it's no problem with it. But unless you have the importation, it doesn't, it just, you know, if it is done with the wrong, can we preach someone else's message? Absolutely. And we can learn from one another. But you either hear from the Lord straight or you don't. So there is prophetic revelation in the house. But don't be one of those who are in Nazareth was in Nazareth where Jesus was when it says in his own hometown he could do no miracle because he was just Joseph he was just the carpenter's little boy Joseph's little boy is he the son of God? surely he is not the son of God he's got brothers here and they named the brothers and he's got sisters and he's got you know he's and, and, and the scripture goes on, I read it this morning, and it says he can do no greater miracle here. They were offended, and he said these words. He said, a prophet is not known. Not a pastor, not a teacher. A prophet is not known in his own hometown. Every word in the Bible has a specific meaning. So when Jesus said a prophet is not known in his own hometown, he doesn't say a teacher. He doesn't say a pastor, which means a, a pastor will always be accepted in their own hometown. An evangelist will be celebrated in their hometown. A prophet will be hated in their own hometown. So, offense is there as the greatest weapon of the enemy to trip people up and short or short circuit and delay their destinies. And as a prophet or even as a gift, as anybody that has gone further than somebody else, it is difficult to see that somebody is trapped. But pride keeps them trapped. Pride keeps them entrapped. And they cannot go further. Every single one of you here has a calling of God on your life. That's no doubt. And the devil comes after those who have a calling. He comes after those whom the call of God is on their lives. And he brings the weapon of offense. And Jesus is saying to his disciples, he said, I have chosen all 12 of you, but one is a devil. Because one took closeness too far and underestimated what they have. You see, proximity is dangerous. Proximity can be a greatest blessing or it can be a greatest curse. Because when proximity is too close and our hearts are not right, we fail to appreciate what we have. 
and we become completely blinded. That is why it's very difficult for people even to get their own family saved because their families just see them as a normal person. Are you guys with me? So how do I prophesy? I have to wait for the spirit of prophecy to come that is stirred by the honor and the lack of familiarity. It's the only way. And I pray to God that I don't step into sanctuary and, and that doesn't come on me, which it does many times not come on me, but I can step into another church and it just rushes on me. It's all because of how we receive a prophet or not. So that nothing to do with money. It is about a faith and a heart attitude. We've had people that left us 10 years ago and then they come back. And then they realize they were stuck in the same place. But not only that, that the devil has deceived them and that they took offense. And we can blame and we can blame and we can blame, but the thing is, 10 years is lost. Are you guys with me? 10 years is lost. So the devil doesn't have to remove your destiny. He just has to delay it. Because you are in time, whether we like it or not. We will pass away at 60, 70, 80. God willing, later than that. But uh, that is life. And all the devil has to do is distract. which we have seen all over. So you must put yourself in a place where God has to use you. Let me put it in another position, in another thing. You must put yourself in a place where God needs you. There is a place where God needs you. There's a place where you can put yourself into, where you become important in the kingdom of God. That God is saying, if I remove you, I'm going to lose so many thousands of souls. If something has to happen to you, I'm going to lose so many people. So there's an extra favor that comes on your life, an extra grace and an extra protection that comes on your life. Are you guys with me? But offense removes us from that place. So, say with me, the decree of the watchers. So we see Daniel 4 verse 17, he says, by this, this decision is by the decree of the watchers and the sentence, say with me, the sentence, which is the verdict, is by the word of the holy ones. Now, now let's, let's go, let's, let's jump, jump to, to, let's jump to, let me see where. Let's go to verse 28. So Daniel interprets in from, you know, there on from verse 19, Daniel interprets his dream. And then we get to verse 28. And we see, I just want to see if this is here or not. So I'm just speaking about the spirit right now. I'm not, this is not prepared and we'll jump now to where we're going to. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, he was walking about the royal palace of Babylon. So did the royal palace. So Nebuchadnezzar was walking and he had this great kingdom. Now listen to this, verse 30. The king spoke, now this is the problem. So with me our words. The king spoke saying, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? He doesn't mention the Lord anywhere. It's I, me, and myself. Verse 31. While the words, so the while the words, 
was still in the king's mouth, meaning why he uttered this message, a voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken that the kingdom has departed from you. What was heaven waiting for? An agreement. So it was by the decree of the watchers already spoken. But they were sitting in anticipation, waiting to see if earth is going to witness and agree with what heaven has prophesied and has said. So heaven might have said one thing about you, but what is your mouth saying? It doesn't matter if there's no such thing to be predestined for destruction. Are you guys with me? Judas was not predestined for destruction. I believe he had a choice. You are predestined to one thing and one thing only. To be conformed to the image of the Son of God. That is what the Bible is saying. So the predestination upon your life, meaning God's good purpose and will. Predestined before you were even formed in your mother's womb. He has planned and set your course out to be conformed to the image of His Son. So it doesn't matter what prophecy comes to you or what somebody has said, or even if you think it's God's will for you to be destroyed. God is looking for somebody, like Jesus was walking past the Seraphonician woman that said, my daughter is demon-possessed. And He said, depart from me, for you are a dog. Meaning that the children's bread, the deliverance, is only for the lost children of Israel, the lost sheep of Israel. It's only for the Jews. It's not for you. And she carried on, meaning he said, he prophesied to her, your daughter will not get delivered. You cannot have prosperity. You cannot have deliverance. You cannot have healing. And she refused to accept it. You can change God's mind about you. But by the way, God's mind about you is goodness. The only problem is that people believe the devil and they're sitting under the law and the curse of the law and they think God is angry at them. They have placed themselves under a curse by their own words. It's called a self-imposed curse. Are you guys with me? Have you, have you seen it's? it's a self-imposed curse. How do I do a self-imposed curse? I speak things over my own life which God has to agree with because heaven has to agree with it. So the decree of the watcher said one thing. And then as Nebuchadnezzar was saying, a voice fell from heaven. And the voice get, went on in verse 32. It says, and they shall drive you from men and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen and seven times shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever He chooses. Now, I'm not going on with that, but say with me, offense. So Jesus is saying to His disciples, He's saying, listen here, all you twelve are around me, but one is a devil. What was He? He was already prophesying to try to help Judas. Because if Judas was sensitive, he would have known. But pride blinds. Say with you the blessings of God. You know, I shared, um, I shared, uh, 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 I shared this morning in Krugersdorp, I said how the blessing of God is upon our lives in a sense of I'm just taking my life personally. Have we worked hard? We definitely have worked hard. But I know pastors that have worked harder than me. Um, but yet there was a favor from God that was on us. Now can it, can it, um, can it uh, 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 have, be, can, could it have been better? I think it could be better. But I realize everything that we have Right now, I would say most of the things outside of ministry, because ministry, we are believing for big things and it will come. But, but uh, everything we have personally is what I prayed for, what I've seen, what I've spoken, 
and a desire I wanted. Meaning God is not only here to, rec to answer your needs, He's here to answer your wants. The only thing is people pray for their needs to be met. He's not here to meet your needs. He's here to meet your wants. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Not I shall not need. I shall not want. Meaning there's wants and desires that God wants to bless you with. I am not an anomaly. I am not somebody special. I was just somebody that was in church when I got saved and I was hungry for more of God. And I placed this kingdom first. God is my witness in everything. Up until as far as I can remember. Up until from as far as I can remember. Give everything away I had. I might have been foolish at some points, but God honored the faith. Faith pleases Him. He's a generous God. The moment we are generous, what happens? We begin to reflect God's image. You see, many people are controlled by, they are run, their lives are steered by offenses. The older we get, the more we get into what we call self-preservation. And as we get into self-preservation, what once used to be an open hand is now a closed hand. Where we once used to trust Him, we're no longer trusting Him and we're keeping for ourselves. Which means we are led by another voice. Are you guys with me? So we are no longer reflecting the image of God and then people wonder, but why? Uh, is there no breakthrough? Or why is the presence not here? Why this? Why that? What is the things in my life? Because the moment I become offended is the moment generosity stops. What is generosity? Giving out in every area that I have. Being able to be generous towards people. How many people have you helped this week? How many people have you preached the gospel or reached out? How many people have you given up your time to go and deliver and pray for deliverance or prophesy over them or sit till late with them or help with a family issue or help with a marriage? How many people, or when last have you done it? People become selfish. They serve a God called self, the Antichrist. Everybody's waiting, is Putin the Antichrist? Uh, is Trump the Antichrist? Is Biden the Antichrist? Is Cyril the Antichrist? Um, is, what, you know, we, we're looking for the Antichrist. Yet John says it is the spirit of the Antichrist that is sitting next to you in church. Which was Gnosticism at that time. And I can get into the theological teaching on it. But what is Antichrist? It is not Antichrist. It is Pseudo-Christ. Which means another type. Or an instead of. So it is not an antichrist, it is a pseudo Christ, which means there's another Christ I'm worshiping. So when people no longer trust God, what are they trusting themselves? What is new age? It is self-worship. It is replacing Christ with myself. So we get to a place where we say Christ consciousness, or we say these certain words, and because uh, it is new age that comes in, this Gnosticism that comes in, and it replaces Christ. Are you guys with me? So many people, so I want to get back to the blessing. So many people lose blessings. There's a blessed life that you have. Or there is a blessed life, let me say it like this. A lot of people are waiting for blessings. And they don't understand they are already blessed. But they cancel themselves from the blessing when they not apply a certain principle in their lives and they allow offense to come in. Listen to me, the moment the seed of offense is there, it will blind you and trap you. Unless somebody comes and shakes you out of it, you will go deeper in those stages and the end result is demonization. And before you know it, you're back out into the world in a life of sin. Are you saved? Yes. Are you missing out on blessings? Absolutely. And then you wake up 10 years later and you say, oh, I want to get back into church. What has happened? The devil just stole 10 years of your life through one seed called offense. One little thing. 
It is the only weapon that Satan has in his arsenal in the New Testament that he can use against believers. It is the root of bitterness that causes a person to fall from grace back into the law. The moment they fall into the law, a revival of sin comes into their lives. If you are not under the law, but you are under grace, sin is not existing in your life. Are you guys with me? The Bible says that grace has dominion over sin. We who are under grace has dominion over sin. And sin will not have dominion over us. So what does the root of bitterness, which is offense, do? It makes me fall from grace into a place in the law, in that area. So, and Paul is saying, when I was in the law, or where there is law, sin is revived. Meaning there's a revival of sin. Revival is used once in the New Testament. And it is in relation to sin, not an outputting of the Spirit of God. Are you guys with me? And where offense is, trust me, there's a variety. When somebody has taken offense and they've become demon, I know there is a lot of sin. But what happens? Pride causes self-righteousness to come in and say, I have to protect myself. We get into self-preservation, reputation. Every sin that Lucifer had, we begin to fall in. It's I, 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 I. And I no longer begin to trust people, even if it is some individuals. So I'll have these words come out of my house, my words. You know, that one I don't trust, or that, and there's no reason. And yet these ones are brothers in Christ. Yes, don't trust them with your children. But I'm speaking of when somebody has suspicion that entered them, or mistrust that has entered them. It means there's a wound that's not healed. And the presence can no longer flow out of you. You see, this is what happens is when offense is there, you're unable to release the glory and you're unable to receive it. You can stand in the church and you can worship God and you can say, I felt him a little bit. I felt a bit of peace. But the presence, the witness, the unction of the Holy Ghost, the witness of heaven doesn't come on you. It means our hearts are misaligned. I have taken offense. I am not under the alignment of heaven. Something has shifted my heart or something has taken the love of my heart and has taken it away from the love of God. Something has stolen my heart and misaligned it away from the Lord. So the presence is no longer on my life. So people can stand in a worship service or in a church and the rivers are not flowing offense is blocking it when offense has entered into someone's life they are unable to pray just stay with are you guys with me we'll switch to preach but what is it preaching fire and just preaching if we don't teach you these things the bible says if you have regard sin in your heart the lord will not hear your prayer so when offense is in my heart, I pray, but the Lord is not hearing my prayer. So there is no reciprocation of the presence back. So I'm praying, but nothing is coming back. So now I end up in a life where I'm not even praying, or I'm convincing myself even that I'm praying. But it is not a relationship with God or a secret place relationship that I used to have where I could just get there and the glory and the witness of God would be there and the presence of God would be there. So now it begins to pull away. You see, God comes in so gently. Oh, sorry, God comes in with a noise and He leaves gently. The Bible says Sam, the presence of the Lord departed from Samson and he knew it not. The presence of the Lord can depart from somebody. Yeah, but the Bible says you'll never leave nor forsake us. Yes, the presence within, but I'm speaking of the presence upon. The presence upon can depart from somebody and they know it's not because he gently pulls away. Are you guys with me? But the devil gently comes in and leaves you with a bang. He leaves you with a mess. 
So the devil gently enters into someone's life. God comes in with a bang. You have an encounter with him. An upper room experience in the book of Acts. God comes in with the tongues of fire. With, with a wind, with the sound of a wind at Pentecost. With tongues of fire coming in. And a sound that is coming into the place. And he shakes you up or the building begins to shake. And you have an encounter with God. But he leaves gently. Now when offense is also there. Do you know I can preach like this. And the words are unable to penetrate someone's heart. You can ask them afterwards. What did I preach? Um, they won't even be able to remember. Because the word cannot take root on a ground that is unfruitful. Are you guys with me? What does offense do? Offense gets an audience. Always. Offense has an audience. Offense never stands alone. Offense find others to talk to. I call it the double tongue. This tongue of a snake. A tongue of a snake is two pieces. It says one thing and another thing. Bitter and sweet waters coming out of the mouth of one. When somebody has taken offense, bitter and sweet waters can come out. And the Lord does not delight in such a person. The Bible says, who shall stand in the presence of the Lord? Who shall stand in this holy hill? He who has a clean heart, who has pure, a pure heart, clean hands. He who has not lifted up his heart to an idol. And he who has not done his neighbor any wrong or spoken ill of his neighbor, and he who has integrity in his heart. So God is saying there are some with certain characteristics that can stand in my presence. And only those with that characteristic, if they don't have it, if they are double-tongued, if they speak against this one, you know, I just didn't grow up like that. When I got saved, I loved the Lord. I wanted the best, I wanted the best uh, what I could get from God. Um, and then you get into the church world and you hear how people, you know, especially when you start off in ministry, you're ushering, car guarding, by the door, packing the chairs. The enemy that will come to you to remove you is gossip. And the tongue will come. Others will even come and talk. As dangerous as it is for them to talk, it is also dangerous to hear. Because the moment you have heard, you cannot unhurt. Are, are you guys with me? So what does offense do? I, I explained in Kruger's door, offense comes and, uh, 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 and say to John, a person will come to John and say, yeah, I love Prophet John. Yes, I was anointed today. Did you see something? Did you, did you see the car he drives? You know, he got another new car. While he's trying to raise money, I mean, he could have put that money in. I'm just saying, I'm not, I'm, you know, my heart is pure in saying it. My heart is pure in saying it. I'm just concerned. Or it will even go a step further from a concern to a disagreement. I disagree with what they said. We had one person. Say with you, the Lord heard it. There was one person in, um, you know, sometimes the devil will talk to wrong people. So there was one person in, in, in the um, counting money or something like that, I think, or, or in the back room. And they were with uh, Lorena, you know, so it was the wrong person. And they said these words. They said, I'm so tired of serving that Leon. I was just somebody that has been with us for, I don't know, at that time, maybe six years. You know, and we were just talking good of them, wanting to actually, actually promote them and help them. Our heart is pure towards them. But what happened? And it wasn't a month after that. It wasn't even brought to our attention. I was only brought to attention, I mean, or to my attention much later. But God hears. And before you know it, the person is gone. But what happened? They began to get an audience. 
And then I can guarantee you now there will be nowhere until they make right with what they've done. The Lord will not allow them to move on. I know this thing like the back of my hand. When I have taken offense, that's what I'm saying, many are even here. You might have taken offense with your previous church. You might have taken offense with us. You might have taken offense with a brother here or a sister here. Get your heart clean. It is very serious. We are speaking about destiny matters. I don't care. You see, people are not humble enough to go to somebody and cry and repent. Let's, let's, let's get real. People are always concerned about who is right and who is wrong. That is a devil of stubbornness and pride. And the Lord will never work a move in your life. Never. So what happens? I am then left to the Babylonian system of buying and selling, uh, demand and supply, and I'm left to the wolves and I'll be worse off and what I would have been if I'm, a belie- if I'm an unbeliever and I would have, because t- then at least I wouldn't have this contention in me. But I'm left with the blessing of God doesn't operate on me. Because people are too hard to say, you know what, you have offended me there. Or to go to somebody and say, you know what, I forgive you. Or forgive me for taking offense. People like to say, you know, I forgive you. You have done this against me. I just want to say, I release you. That's, that's very simple and arrogant. But very few can take the road of saying, you know what, forgive me, I might have done this against you. And not even bring up that they have an offense against somebody, but to restore a relationship. And then people wonder why so little people are being used by the Lord. God is looking for those characteristics. Pride will cause a person to be stubborn. Ego will come in. When ego comes in, the Lord begins to resist. The Lord begins to push away pride. Why? It reminds him of one person called, one angel called Lucifer. So when someone has pride, there's a reminder of Lucifer upon them. So the one is a devil. Let it not be me. That must, that's, meaning there is one that must be a devil. But your heart can choose and say, I will resist this thing. That it will not have an action in my life. So Jesus said, one of you is a devil. Because he was giving a prophecy. Are you guys with me? He was giving a prophecy. And he was trying to say and give an opportunity to Judas to say, it doesn't need to be you. The fact that Jesus used the word and means that he gave an opportunity that it could be somebody else. Okay. Are you guys with me? That's why we see Peter. So where did Judas take offense? Give me the verse about the alabaster box uh, somewhere. Maybe we can search for it. I think it is Mark, uh, Matthew 26 verse 7. Let me read it. Matthew 26 verse 7. It says this. Uh, A woman came to him having an alabaster flask of very costly fragrant oil. And she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. But when his disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, why this waste? Is there not a different, let me, let me look for a different one. I want to see if there's one that is, uh, is it Luke? Is it Matthew? Hey? Satan entered him. Is it this one? Matthew. Oh, okay, okay. So, Matthew. So, very fragrant oil, and she put it out on his head and he sat at the table. But when his disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? For this fragrant oil might have been sold for much and given to the poor. But when Jesus was aware of it, He said to them, why do you trouble the woman? For she has 
done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, but me, you do not have the always. For in pouring this fragrant oil on my body, she did it for my burial. Meaning she's more prophetic than you, Judas. She's more, she, she, she sees with a greater prophetic eye than you, Judas. You're blinded. Surely I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in this whole world, that this woman, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. Then one of the twelve called Judas Iscariot went to the chief priest and said, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver. So from that time he sought an opportunity to betray him. So with me to betray him. So we see here, right here was the moment. There's another place at the Last Supper where it says that Satan entered him, but it's not actually where it entered him. It was at this moment where Judas disagreed with his leadership style. Are you guys with me? Can we get into the, um, into, into, I want us just to get into, I'm just preaching by the Spirit. I'm just looking for something. So, so now we can go to, go with me to John chapter number 13, verse 2. John 13, verse 2. When I come here, I rarely have notes on a Sunday evening. I try to give as the Holy Spirit leads. So we see that Judas disagreed by the, the alabaster box the oil being poured out. And he was upset because he was the accountant of Jesus' ministry. And he was helping himself to some finances. And he said, but we could have sold that, we could have sold that perfume. Get a lot of money for the ministry because I am actually stealing from it. Are you guys with me? Now listen to this, John 13 verse 2. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas. So with him, the devil, the opposer, Diablos, having put into the heart. He hasn't entered him yet, but he put into the heart of Judas, Simon's son, to betray him. So we see how the devil comes, he brings a seed, a suggestion, and a thought. And it started where Judas disagreed with Jesus' leadership style when he received the perfume from the woman. It is a thought. Say with me a thought. A suggestion is the same as Diablos. Diablos means that it is, uh, it is when the Bible says the devil entered or when the Bible says that Jesus said one of you is a devil. The word devil is Diablos. Diablos means to dia and to blow, which means to throw until it pierces through. Which means it is a thought that comes into your head, but it means further than that. It is an accuser, a slanderer, an attacker, an opposer, and one who speaks and gossips, being used as the tool of Satan. That's what it means in the Thayer's Greek uh, 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 interpretation. Are you guys with me? John 13, verse 2. Go over to verse 21. Now listen to this. So understand this, that Jesus keeps giving him an opportunity. John 13, verse 21. When... Jesus had said these things. He was troubled in spirit. So he troubled in spirit. When there is an offender close to you, or somebody that has taken offense, there is trouble. The Lord will put in your spirit a troubling. And testified and said, Most assuredly I say to you, one of you will betray me. What is he doing? He's giving Judas another opportunity. Are you guys with me? One of you will betray me. Next verse. Then the disciples looked at one another, perplexed about whom he spoke. You see, a betrayer will never know. Somebody so offended cannot see it. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples, whom Jesus loved. Now this is John writing it and he was speaking about himself. He said, you know, there was one guy that was lying on his chest which was basically him. And Simon Peter therefore mentioned to him to ask who it was of whom he spoke. Then leaning back on Jesus' breast, he said to him, Lord, John is saying, he said, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. 
And having dipped the bread, say with me dipping. Listen here, this is what Jesus was doing. He took the cup like this, let's say dipping, into however it was used. He put a piece of bread. He dipped it into, into the cup. But he says, to, I will give it the one whom I give it. Did he say Judas? He was still giving an opportunity for Judas to change. So he said, I will dip it as a sign. Because I will give time when I dip that thing. When I dip it, he gave it then to Judas. The son of Simon. Next verse. Now after the piece of bread, so if he, Satan entered him. So there are levels. First Satan put it into his heart to betray Jesus. Then Satan entered him. This is the stage of demonization. An offended person will become a demonized person if it is not dealt with. They will be, listen, a believer offended can become more demonized than an unbeliever that is full of sin. Because the moment a believer, Satan finds a believer that is legal ground, he festers, he, inf he infects that person's whole being with demonic spirits. Everybody can see it except the one that is demonized. Are you guys with me? I hope this message is okay. You are not excited. I understand. Satan entered him. Then Jesus said to him, so he was giving an opportunity already. Judas didn't perceive the opportunity. Now obviously we are in a covenant of grace. Are you guys with me? We are in a season of grace, but don't use it to think everything will be okay. A lot of times, and I'm very careful not to make this mistake, a lot of times people can preach grace but they're leaving it actually up to fate and not grace. Let me explain to you. So a lot of times people can preach grace and they are so into grace and they can say, ah, oh, don't worry, the Lord will sort it out. But actually what they're saying is, don't worry, fate will work it out. No, no, no. There is still a responsibility on our part. Grace teaches us. Are you guys with me? Grace empowers us. Grace doesn't do it for us. He has done our salvation on the cross and the finished work of the cross. But it still takes us to take the cross and apply it upon our lives. Because I've seen many believers that are saved, but they are demonized. So they've got salvation, but not deliverance. I've seen many believers that are salvation, but they are not healed. So they haven't received the full package of salvation. So what is grace? Grace is there available, but it causes, it's the propitiation of the sins of the world. But it needs to be appropriated. So it needs me to take the blood, appropriate on my life without works, but by faith, take the blood and appropriate on my life. So he gave J Judas an opportunity. Judas didn't listen. He was blinded. Now it says, now after the piece of bread, Satan entered him. Then Jesus said to him, what you do, do it quickly. A betrayer. Say with me, a betrayer. A betrayer, if it is in your business, will divulge all your secrets to your enemies. They are there. In a ministry... It is a devil that is sent in to bring a ministry down. Are you guys with me? I said this morning, a traitor should be executed on the spot. What you do, do quickly. Next verse. But no one at the table knew for what reason he said this to him. For, just flow with me guys. For some thought... Because Judas had the money box that Jesus has said to them, buy those things we need for the feast. Or that he should give something to them. Listen, these disciples had no spiritual inclination at all. <laughs> they are like my team before they received importation. <laughs> okay. I said to Pastor Stephen always, I'm like, when you lived in my house, you asked me the most stupid questions. I didn't even answer him. He would ask me a question. I'll just, I'll just like shake my head and ignore. <laughs> to the natural person, 
the things of the spirit is foolishness. They cannot understand it. But to the spiritual man, he discerns, he understands, he dissects everything spiritually. So when a person is spiritual, you can speak spiritual things. But when a person doesn't have a spiritual mind, you can't speak spiritual things. They'll become offended. So having received the piece of bread, then he went out immediately. So with me, and it was night. It became night for Judas. Are you guys with me? Let's go to, let's go to John 20 verse 23. So unforgiveness and offense is like drinking poison, hoping somebody else will die. Or the sin of offense and the sin of unforgiveness is worse than the act of the sin done against you. Let me give you an example. Somebody does something to you that makes you offended. They speak to you bad. They do something, even to the point of abuse. And you can say, but how dare you say that? How can that be worse than unforgiveness? Because unforgiveness brings tormentors into your life. It doesn't remove salvation. Nothing can remove salvation. Are you guys with me? But what it does do is it brings tormentors into my life. And it causes me to be tormented at night. What is tormenting? I cannot sleep. I'm full of anxiety. I am tormented by thoughts of confusion, thoughts of fear, indecisive. I am a tormented person. Where there is tormenting, there is demons. Nothing of the Spirit of God does that. It means there is an offense and an open, a root of bitterness that has come in. So listen to this, John 20. So how do we deal with this thing? So let me just say this. So the sin of unforgiveness is worse than the act of sin done against it. So the thing that has caused that offense is not as bad as the offense itself. If I have unforgiveness or offense against somebody, it is worse than what they did to me in the sight of the Lord. Are you guys with me? God does not think the way that we think. How is it that King David can commit murder, commit adultery, commit murder of many people because he was not out on what he was supposed to be doing? And he just asked, and he just repented. The Lord says, That's fine. You are forgiven. Saul just doesn't um, kill all the, all the, what was it, the Amazon, what? Amalekites. He just keeps one of them. And as he keeps one of them, the Lord is saying the kingdom, of the, the kingdom is going to be taken from you. And the Bible says that the Lord departed from Saul. Simply because of something small. Yet David commits all these sins. And the Lord is saying immediately it is forgiven, it is forgiven you. There is something about God when it comes to favorites. Are you guys with me? Now in Christ we are all favorites. But there are some that appropriate it to their lives or don't appropriate it to their lives. There are some that has a revelation of it or they don't have a revelation of it. What is new creation realities? It's when you fully understand you are a new created being. You are a kainos. Not everything that you have done in your past is wiped clean. That when you understand that you are under grace, sin has no power and is not sin in your life. But what does the Lord do? It brings condemnation. It kills and it brings doubts. It brings double-mindedness and it brings a double-tongued. It causes somebody to be under the law and it strengthens sin in their lives. It causes a revival to bring. So why are we preaching new creation realities? So that somebody can get under the grace of God. And they can realize, but wait, it doesn't matter what I've done, I'm forgiven. Not in an arrogant way. Knowing how to receive from the goodness of God. Knowing how to be conformed to the image of the Son. So sin has no hold over you. But today's Christians, 98% of them are bound by sin because they are not under grace. They cannot receive the things of God. They don't understand the goodness of God. I cannot remember 
And I honestly genuinely say this. I cannot remember the last time I thought of a sin I did. Now, according to John in the Bible, it says that I'm a liar. But John wasn't speaking to us as believers. John had a church that was mixed with Gnostics and believers. Are you guys with me? Because the Bible says he who is born of God is no sin. And in another place it says he who is born of God does not, cannot sin. So we're saying we are sinless. No, there was one that was sinless. Jesus Christ. Our sins are forgiven. We are not sinless. It is forgiven. It is washed. It is clean. But there was one who was sinless. But because of him, we are made in his image. If we stay under grace, sin, you will not be sin conscious. You'll be righteous conscious. I cannot remember the last time I committed a sin. I know it sounds so arrogant. And it is a good clip to be made on the internet. Did I say I didn't say no? I just said I can't remember. I didn't say I didn't commit one. I am not sin conscious. When I am sin conscious, condemnation will kill me. Wherever there's condemnation, there's death. Condemnation kills. So the condemnation kills. The letter kills. But the Spirit gives life. So get away out under the letter and get under grace. That you know, that you know, that you know that the blood has done its full work. The thing is we cannot know it because we are not delivered. Many are not delivered. They are demonized because of offense. So I know if I take offense, it is a foothold that the enemy has in my life. Are you guys with me? So let's go to John 20 verse 23. Let me explain to you something quickly before I pray for you. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Read it for me again. Say, if you, they are forgiven. Does, does it say if Jesus forgive the sins? Does it say if God forgive the sins? Does it say if you forgive the sins? Meaning you have been given the power to hold a sin against somebody. And as you hold the sin against that person, it will have an actual effect and they are not set free. Now let's put it in context this verse. Are you guys with me? Let's go to 2 Corinthians 2 verse 5. 2 Corinthians 2 verse 5. But listen to this. So I'm going to put in the Amplified for me. Amplified for me. I want to show you the power of the local church. I shared it this morning a little bit in Krugersdorp. What Jesus meant when he said you have the power to forgive sins. And you have the power to retain sins. People don't understand the power of the local church. You know, we have people that have left the church out of full rebellion. It's going to sound so arrogant in saying it. And as long as they stay in that and they are not repenting, they are not forgiven of it unless the church releases them. The power of the local church is so powerful. Only a rebellion mind is going to fight this right now. That you have been given the keys to bind and to loose. I'm going to show you now. Are you guys with me? And given the keys to bind and loose, you have the keys to bind. Not Satan. I know we made it. We, we bind Satan here and bind Satan there. No. To bind. Uh, I don't, maybe I'm not preaching to encounter. I'm seeing your faces. You look like... You need to go home, so I'm not going to explain to you that. God bless you. Let's go to Corinthians 5 2 or 2 5. It doesn't say bind Satan, but I'm not going to get into that. I'm going to deal with offense because I'm not sure if familiarity has entered or offense has entered. And this message is for my. 
congregation, the leaders, and the pastors. Because even the pastors and my leaders can get close and familiarity can come in. If you rebuke a wrong one, if you rebuke a scorner, the Bible says he will hate you. But if you rebuke a wise person, he will love you. So you rebuke a wrong person, in their heart there'll be a hardness that'll come. They'll smile at you, but they, they're planning something. The Bible makes it very clear. But I will rather rebuke somebody and deal with something that the presence of the Lord can flow out of their lives. It is my job. If you see your child not, if you see something wrong in your child's life, you deal with it. You can say, okay, but wait, that thing is not as bad. I can leave it. They're going to grow over that. That's a small thing. You don't discipline everything as a, as a parent. There are measures and the same thing in the church and the same thing with God. God doesn't just destroy us over one thing. No, there's a lot of grace. In fact, there's so, but I want to give you the power of the local church. This is the power of the local church. Listen to this. But if someone, and Paul was speaking about the one among you who committed incest, the one who slept with his mother-in-law, has caused all this grief and pain. He has caused it not to me, but in some measure, not to put too severely, he has distressed all of you. So listen to this. Paul is speaking to the Corinthian church. Are you all with me? He's saying there's one who stepped with his mother-in-law. He was unrepentant. And he's caused not really trouble to me, but mostly trouble to you. And he caused you to be distressed. So he un he's unsettled the church. For such a one, verse 6, for such a one, the censure by the majority which he has received is sufficient for punishment. So listen. In the first letter, he puts the guy out of the church for discipline. Are you guys with me? 1 Corinthians 5, am I right? 1 Corinthians 5. My pastors don't know. So uh, 1 Corinthians 5, he put him out of the, out of the, uh, uh, out of the, uh, out of the church. He said, put such a one out for the saving of his spirit. So he says, let's put discipline on such a one. Put him out of the church because he is unrepentant. But Paul is applying the, the power of binding and loosing that is only given to the church, not an individual. Stay with me. Are you guys with me? So he said, church, you can bind a person or you can loose a person. This is the power of the local church. Let me put it to you in other words. You can forgive the sins of someone. Or you can retain the sins of someone. The church. Why the church? You are the body of Christ. If it is only Christ that can forgive sins. And you are the body of Christ. You are underestimating the power and the authority that is given to the local church. You have keys to bind and keys to loose. Are you guys with me? If I'm teaching heresy, you can tell me, but you can have your seats. Let's go on. So Paul is saying, put this one out. Give him over to Satan. Give his flesh over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. Hand him over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit may be saved. Now we jump one letter further. Second Corinthians. And he says, for such a one is this censure by majority which he has received. So it's basically Paul is saying, listen here, the sentence that this one has received is sufficient for him. He has paid his sentence. I want you to receive him back into the church. Are you guys with me? Verse 7. So instead of further rebuke, now you should rather turn and graciously forgive. Hold on. So they were told not to forgive. Are you guys with me? Or should we go home? You, I need you to respond, please. I hope you're not offended that you can't hear the word. I'm going to provoke everything, trust me. If I preach an offense, I'm going to provoke it. It's not because I'm rude. It's just who I am and I cannot pretend to be someone else. He says, I want you to now forgive. Which means you are not forgiving the person. But I thought unforgiveness will uh, send us to hell. No, Paul said, don't forgive this one. 
until he repents. Because if you forgive him, his sins is going to be forgiven him and he's going to go out and cause rain. But, he, but we need to save his spirits. So don't forgive him. Hold his sins. This is a teaching that people are going to run a mock with. But I'm explaining truth with for you. Because this is the reason why many people are in torment. They've messed up at churches with genuine authority. And we're not the only church. There are many churches with genuine authority. And they've messed up even there. Or they try to split a church or this or that and they are in torment. And they say, oh no, but I am the church, you know. There's no such thing as a building. No, 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 no. Jesus gave His full authority to the church. He gave the keys to bind and to loose to the church. He gave the keys of the kingdom to the church. Are you guys with me? To the church, not to an individual. I know we like to preach to us. No, He gave the keys to the church. I mean, collectively, the church has power to forgive or to retain sins. So now He's saying, I want you to forgive this one. Comfort and encourage him to keep him from being overwhelmed by excessive sorrow and despair. Do you know there are people that we have that that has either left us with great offense or whom we have disciplined that they are overwhelmed right now with excessive despair and sorrow, so that one day they can repent? It's the authority of the local church. Stop looking at me like you are angry with me. This is the Bible. This is the power that he has given to the local church. The local church just hasn't walked in this power. Because they are like whimsical and saying, Oh, we need to love this one. We need to love that. Love is not in the question, in question here. This is the authority and keys that he gave to the church. Are you guys with me? So he says, this one is going to be an excess of sorrow and despair if you don't do this right now. Let's go to verse 8. I therefore beg you to reinstate him. Bring him back into your membership in your affections and assure him of your love for him. Say with me, assure him of your love for him. You know, so many Christians can keep judging a person and they don't understand the grace and the goodness of God that, okay, the time is over, receive such a one back now. Verse 9, For this was my purpose in writing to you, to test your attitude and see if you would stand the test, whether you are obedient and altogether agreeable to following my orders, so within my orders, in everything. If you forgive anyone anything, I too forgive that one. And what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sakes in the presence and with the approval of Christ. So he says, when I forgive that person, he is fully forgiven. As the one who planted the church. He says, you will forgive him. But then I also forgive him by the approval of Christ. So that he can come back into the fold. So that the hand of discipline, the left hand of God, can be lifted from his life. And the right hand of God can be reinstated on his life. This is the power of Satan. This to keep Satan, so that to keep Satan from getting the advantage over us. For we are not ignorant of his wiles and intentions. We are not ignorant of his weapons and his arsenal. Meaning that the devil has the greatest weapon he has is the weapon of offense. Paul is saying, listen here, I want you to forgive what's one. Because if you don't, offense is going to take him over. And we, we are not unaware of Satan's weapons. We know the devil is going to take him out by offense. So now, yes, he repented. He also forgiven us. Now you forgive him and you receive him back into the church. And the moment you forgive him, guess what? All his sorrow will, will disappear like this. So you as a church has the power to forgive somebody or retain a sin against them. And the moment you forgive them and you receive them back into the fold, it is like all the torment is over in one second. It does, they could be out there, they could be fasting and praying. Nothing will happen until the church forgives them. Are you guys with me? This is the scripture. Let's go on. So, 
What does offense do? How do I deal with offense? We're going to pray for people right now. How do I deal with offense? A church that doesn't offend you is not a real church. A church must offend you. A leader must offend you. Are you guys with me? A prophet will offend you. In my preaching, I will offend you. In my greeting you, I will offend you. Sometimes I will smile, I'll do the best, but I just offend someone. It is a proper offense. It's one of those things. A pastor hugs. <laughs> Matthew 5 verse 23. How do I get through offense? How do I get over my offense? There are people here that will take a court up by an offense. Some are blinded to it. Some are, um, some are uh, uh, blinded to it. Some are um, not aware of it. I want the Spirit of God to reveal to you tonight if there is an offense, if there is an unforgiveness. Anyone. This doesn't mean I, it's, me, it's me that for anybody that has offended you, whether it's your brother or your sister or a family member. But you see, it is very easy to come forward for prayer and say, oh, okay, Lord, I forgive them. It is very difficult to go to them and bring restitution and reconcile. So will they reconcile? Go to Matthew 5, 23. Put on the screen, Matthew 5, 23. Uh, But in the King James Version. <laughs> so listen to this. Therefore, if you bring your gift, say with me, gift, to the altar. Gift isn't only monetary, but anything. Your worship, your, uh, your money, you, anything. If you bring your gift to the altar, and there you remember that your brother has something against you, not you against your brother. Your brother has something against you. Are you guys with me? A lot of people only want to forgive somebody because somebody has hurt them. No, no, no. The Bible is saying, if you remember, but wait, that person actually doesn't like me or has something against me. Somewhere I have hurt them. Somewhere I've said something that has affected them. And you just carry on as nothing has happened. You know we can kill people by our words. I know if somebody is saved by their words, the way they talk, the way they treat people, the kindness they have, the sweet spirit they have. If they have a sweet spirit or an attitude or an ego spirit or a stinking attitude, or a hardness. A lot of people have a hardness in them. Or they can show no emotions or no empathy. There's a hardness in them. They have taken offense. Are you guys with me? So the Bible says, if you know somebody has something against you, leave your gift before the altar. Leave it. They don't even worship God. Go your way. Leave the house of God. Say so with me, first be reconciled. Say so reconciled. The word reconciled is dialasso. And it means this. It means to change your mind towards somebody. To change what you used to think about them. To change it. To renew your friendship with somebody. To renew. Say so with me, renew your friendship. To be reconciled. To change your feelings towards somebody. To forgive them completely for what they have done. To ask them forgiveness to restore a relationship. To bring peace between two parties. To remove strife and to remove gossip and talking. This is what it means to be reconciled. Are you guys with me? So he says, first be reconciled to your brother. And then... Come and offer your gift at the altar. So, many people 
are not financially blessed because they have offense against others and others and they have offended others have something against them so guess what they bring their gift to the altar and God cannot receive it are you with me church hey are you with me okay You bring your tithe, you bring your offering. God cannot receive it. Not because you are offended, you, you are against somebody. Because you have hurt somebody. And they have something against you. And God cannot receive your gifts. Are you with me? You with me? So people come, they put their offering in here. And they go and they pray and, they, and, and there's no blessing. And they say, oh, this isn't fruitful ground. This church isn't working. Sorry, when I say, hey, hey, I'm just dealing with somebody whose devil is distracting them. So they don't, can't receive the word. So people fail to move in financial blessings. Because they bring their gift but they are not offended with anyone. I'm like, oh Lord, I don't have unforgiveness. But so many people don't like them. Because in their stinking attitude or their blinded perception, they offend this one, offend that one, hurt this one, offend that one. And they are not the salt of the earth or the light of the world. They don't have a sweet spirit and a kind person. They're not representing Christ well. So everybody gets offended by them and they bring their gift and God is not blessing them. I am convinced if we get this thing right, you'll be blessed a hundred times more. People come to church ah, because they want to hear the word from Leon and they want to, and only if I preach, they come even in Cougar's door. If I preach, they come. If I don't preach, they don't come. And we have idolatry in our hearts and we serve man in our hearts, not God's. Are you guys with me? We don't come to church to fellowship with one another, to love one another, and to say, but wait, I see my brother is struggling. Why is he struggling? And I go to him and I say, listen, I see your face is down. Your countenance is down. And I don't even have, and we claim to be so spiritual, but we cannot even see if our brothers and sisters are struggling. And the thing is, what has happened to us, church? We want all this great revelation, but yet we offend one another and we bring up and the Bible says it is better for you to tie a stone to your, to your neck and cast it your, and throw yourself off into, the, into the river and sunk and drown yourself than to offend one of these little ones. How many people have we offended? Are you guys with me? How many people just by not greeting them or because we are blinded again by our ego and our pride. We hurt this one, we hurt that one. By our speech because our words are not, salt, are not seasoned with salt. We speak with an attitude. We speak about this one. We gossip to this one and this one over years. That one over years. And we cause people to be stumbling. And we wonder why is God not blessing us or progressing us? Because we are in serving in self. Do you know how many stories come to us? They say, people saying, you know, I overheard that one saying this. And they were speaking about me and about others. Or they were speaking about you, prophet. And they were just speaking openly, speaking loud to somebody. What are they doing? Somebody that is arrogant, has no spiritual sensitivity, full of gossip, full of offense, are causing others to stumble. They are destroying the church. And in turn, they are destroying themselves. And that is why many people are not delivered, not the salt of the earth, or walking in light. That is why it takes me to preach a message, to shake people and say, stop being self-absorbed and consider others. Christianity is about considering one another. If you don't like it, you can leave. And you can go where they are. Um, what are they? Tickling your ears. 
but we don't know the gospel because we just want deep revelations, deep revelations, deep revelations. How about loving one another? Walking in a place of forgiving one another. I just gave you the authority that the local church have, that you have the ability to destroy some. God has given to you the keys like this to the church to say you can choose to let somebody be tormented or not. This is the real gospel. This was written in the Bible. We are his body. He is the head. If we are the body, we are Christ. For this is this great mystery, Paul is saying, that Christ is in us, the hope of glory. So as Christ came for giving sins, you come as the church and as the church collectively, you have the ability to forgive sins or retain sins. Jesus isn't walking on the earth today. You are walking as His body. You are praying for the sick here and you say, may your sins be forgiven you. Rise up and walk. And, you have, and the person's sins are forgiven them. Why? Because of the authority and the keys that you have been given. So this is where people don't understand the seriousness. They talk against this one. They talk against that one. How much you know how much power your words contain? No wonder the presence of the Lord is not on you. No, have your seats. Are you guys with me? Is this a hard word? It is a hard word. It is a hard saying. So people take offense with hard saying. So I won't. So we're going to do a prayer for offense right now. And you can forgive me, but this word will save you. So it says, leave your gift at the altar. Make right with your brother. Then come back and give your gift. Many people leave their gift and they go and they don't even know they've offended this one, hurt that one, hurt this one, hurt that one. Uh, this one left the church because of them. That one left the church because of them. This that. And they don't even consider that. God knows everything and he watches the hearts. Are you guys with me? One thing we need to become, we need to become humble towards people, more humble towards people, more loving towards people. Understand that the one that is standing in front of me is been, has been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. He matters so much or she matters so much that anything that I do to misrepresent Christ to them, I can cause them to be stumbled. I can cause them to stumble. I can cause them to not serve God anymore. That is a great judgment that can come upon me. And do you know where that judgment comes? Not going to hell. You live in hell on this earth. Is the discipline of God like this upon somebody? I think people wonder where are the blessings? Listen to me. In one instance, God can cause, speak, or cause a dream to come to your boss. Don't you think God can cause an angel like this to come into your boss's dream and say, I want you to give that one ten times more than what you, or three times more than what you... Any time you believe God for your salvation, why is that not happening? I can tell you why it is not happening. Because we have issues with one another. Pastors here, leaders here, and the church here have issues. And unless those issues are worked out, or you go to your brother and you say, I repent, forgive me for doing this and for doing that. How is God going to work in your life? So we can very quickly become a church where we think we are the greatest, we are the spiritual, most spiritual, we are the greatest, deepest revelations, and we have the prophet and all these things, but we don't have love. When you don't have love, you have nothing. You can raise the dead, prophesy, speak in the tongues of angels, but if you don't have love, you are Nothing, the Bible says. So when I cause my brother to offend, my sister to offend, I, I offend them. I don't carry the love of God. Are you guys with me? Now, will people be offended out of a divine way where they are tested? Absolutely. But the Bible says, woe to you by whom offenses come. Woe to you. Because it is, it is, it is, if you cause any of these little ones to stumble, 
it is better for you to put a millstone around your neck and throw yourself into the river and drown than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. Woe to you who bring offenses. So if I walk in love, I would consider, take in consideration who am I offending? Not people pleasing. No, no, no. Who am I offending? I don't want to offend anyone. If God divinely offends somebody, that's fine. But I myself, I don't want to offend. I want to love this one. I want to love that one. Why? I'm a representation of Christ. Are you guys with me? So let's go to, so how does it say, how do I deal with it? I go make right, say reconcile, not repent, not repent and standing here by the altar and saying, Lord, forgive. I release that one. No, 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 no. I know we do that as a quick prayer, but to go and reconcile. That's what the Bible says. It doesn't say confess. It doesn't say ask God for forgiveness. No, no, no. It says go and reconcile. Let's get to Matthew 18, verse 15. I'm going to read this and close with this. Matthew 18, verse 15. So let me read this. I think it's in the Amplified. Put it in the Amplified. Let me read it in the Amplified. So if your brother wrongs you, are you guys with me? Stay with me just through these scriptures, please. I want your capacity to be become. Um, I'm going to be your most Sunday evening. So what we are doing is we are... I did, I did say to, um, I did uh, say to Kruger's Dorp, and just to let you know here, that from next month, we have great attendance at Kruger's Dorp in the evenings, but the Lord has just shared with me that a lot of people walk to church at Kruger's Dorp. They walk to church, so, you know, and it's, so we're going to limit the evening services there to one evening service a month. It's got to be one powerful evening service a month. The rest, I'm going to be here, and we're going to be focusing there on the mornings. The mornings is packed out. This morning, we were more in Krugersdorp than in Centurion. So uh, more people there than here. Um, uh, but Centurion is our headquarters. But then I'll be here in the mornings and the evenings. Um, one Sunday evening, I'll be in Krugersdorp. Uh, but listen to this. If your brother wrongs you, Go and show him your his go and show him his faults. And now we get to the opposite. So the other one is if if your brother has something against you, you go and make right. But if your brother is wrong, you go and show him his fault. Everybody loves this one because everybody wants to show fault to one another. Between you and him privately. If he listens to you, you have won back your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take along with you one or two others so that they will be confirmed. And I'm not too worried about this. Go to the next verse. If he pays no attention to them, refusing to listen, take the church and we see. Uh, so on. Next verse, verse 18. Truly I tell you, whatever you forbid, uh, put in the New King James for me. Matthew 18. Listen to this. We'll close with this. I know it's late. Sorry. Assuredly I say to you, whatever you bind, say whatever I bind, on earth and will be bound in heaven and whatever I loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. This got nothing to do with demons. It's to do with church discipline. Are you guys with me? Let's go to uh, uh, verse 19 in the Amplified. I'll put in the Amplified right now in, the, um, in verse 19. Again I tell you, if two of you on earth agree, harmonize together, make a symphony together about whatever, anything and everything they may ask, it'll come to pass and be done for them by my Father in heaven. Verse 20. For whatever two or three are gathered, drawn together as my followers into my name, there I am in the midst of them. Now I'm going to go on to the next, next uh, portion of Scripture. Go to verse 21. Let me see if I, let me read it quickly. I'm going to read it because it's in context of this. Are you guys with me? So he's speaking of if somebody, if there's unforgiveness or something isn't done right. So verse 21 says, Then Peter came up to him and said, Lord, how many times may my brother sin against me and I forgive him and let him go? As many as up to seven times, he's asking. Jesus answered him, I tell you, not up to seven times, but 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a human king who wished to settle accounts with his attendants. When he began the accounting, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. This is about $10 million. Are you guys with me? Is it 10 million? Yeah, $10 million. And because he could not pay, 
His master ordered him to be sold with his wife and his children and everything that he possessed and payment to be made. So the attendant fell on his knees begging him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And this master's heart was moved with compassion and he released him and forgave him, canceling the debt. He's speaking, this is an image of Jesus and God who canceled our debt. Are you guys with me? Of sin. But that same attendant, as he went out, found one of his fellow attendants who owed him a hundred denarii, about twenty dollars. Say with me, twenty dollars. So he was forgiven of ten million dollars. Then he who has been forgiven of $10 million found somebody that has owed him $20 and he caught him by the throat and said, pay what you owe. So his fellow attendants fell down and begged him earnestly. He says, give me time and I'll pay you all. But he was unwilling and he went out and hand him and put him in prison till he should pay the debts. When his fellow attendants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and they were, went and told everything that had taken place to their master. Then his master called him and said to him, you, contempt, you contemptible and wicked attendants, I forgave and canceled all that great debt of yours because you begged me to. And should you not have pity and mercy on your fellow attendant as I had pity and mercy on you? I forgave, literally, I forgave you for 10 million, but this one is $20, you want to kill him? And in wrath, his master turned him over to the torturer. So if he torturers, other translation will say tormentors, till he should pay all that he owed. So also my heavenly father will deal with every one of you if you do not freely forgive your brother from your heart his offenses. Now this isn't speaking of salvation. This is speaking of torture and tormenting that is coming to a person. If we have ever dealt with deliverance, unforgiveness is the first thing. Because torturers and tormentors are coming to them. How am I being tormented? So be the mind. You have thoughts that is coming all over. Thoughts of fear. Where there's fear, there's torture. I'm going to say it again. Where there is fear, there's torture. Where there's fear, there's no power. There's no sound mind. There's no love. Are you guys with me? For the Bible says we do not have a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So where fear is, somebody is tormented. Fear is not just there. No, no, no. Fear comes by a spirit of torture and tormenting. So it starts in the mind, then confusion, then double tongue and double mindedness. Then somebody has intrusive thoughts that comes to them. They have suggestive thoughts that come to them. Everywhere, they cannot sleep. Their mind is busy. What has happened? They are given over the tormentors. They go to psychologist A, psychologist B, psychologist C. Yet all they need to do is deal with the offense and the hurt that they have in their hearts. Where they have not forgiven somebody what somebody has done against them. So what is he saying? He says, it doesn't matter what people have done against you. I have forgiven you of $10 million debt. And any act that somebody else, whether it's abuse, whatever's happened, what they've done against you is equal to $20 to what I've done for you. And you cannot even forgive them of that. And because you cannot forgive them or have mercy on them for that, how can I forgive you? And torturers and tormentors will come. Now we understand our salvation is eternal. But you're not living in eternity right now. <laughs> are you guys with me? You're living on the earth. And many people are tormented because they're not even saved. So not everyone in this building is saved tonight. Not everyone is saved. Please understand me. And you don't need to forgive somebody to get saved. You only need to have faith to get saved. Believe of the Lord Jesus Christ to get saved. That is it. But the tormentors and the torturers comes and it plays in a person's business. It plays in their finances. It plays in the family. It's a curse everywhere in the marriage. Everywhere tormentors and torturers are coming. It is blind. It, it is sorry. It is subtle in the, uh, uh, invisible spiritual forces. You cannot put a natural thing on it. It is spiritually and it comes and torments you. And there is freedom for you. It is when people live in offense, they live in fear. 
there is freedom for you. You cannot release God when you are in this and you cannot receive the presence of the Lord. Why? The Bible says when the torturers and the tormentors come, it is being put into prison. Say with you, prison. It is the prison of offense. It is the jail of offense. You are locked and you cannot move forward. You are locked and your calling cannot come to pass. Your time is delayed and you are losing time. What happens when a person is put into prison for 20 years? They lose 20 years of their life. Are you guys with me? They just lost 20 years. Now they come out there, they have to start all over. Spiritually, uh, uh, the Bible is trying to tell us it's the same concept. It's the same thing. When I have offense, torture comes and I'm put into a prison of offense and I cannot move on. This is why many people are not delivered or cannot get free. And say with me, not only forgiving, say not only forgiving, but reconciling. This is why only two or three percent really gets out of it. Because only two to three percent in my experience has the humility, the recognition, the acknowledging to actually go and reconcile. Not to say I'm sorry. Everybody is sorry. Sorry means I'm going to do it again. Reconcile means I changed my mind of everything that has happened. I hold you to nothing and I can move with you and accept you. You see, sometimes you can hold the sins of a person. You can hold the sins for, for them. From, so you can hold forgiveness from them. You can retain their sins or you can forgive them. That is the power that we've been given as a church. But as individuals, if we don't forgive one another, what is happening? Sins are running rampant. The presence of the Lord is not present. Change doesn't happen in our lives. Transformation doesn't happen in our lives. And we wonder why are we not moving forward. It is time to let that go. What does those things do? It brings in condemnation. It brings in the law. I know it is a hard message tonight. Give me one minute. Are you guys with me? It is, it brings, it causes unity to leave. And it causes people to be trapped. And we can blame this one and blame that one. The thing is, I am responsible. It is I myself that has allowed things. It doesn't matter who has done. Joseph's brothers killed him. So what? At the end of his life, he said, it wasn't you who has done this. It was the Lord that went before me. Meaning Joseph came to such a place of forgiveness. He understood the plan of God. And a lot of us want to hold things personally. What if people that are against you is God's plan to excel you. But you keep holding it personally against one another and you're kept from the promotion that God has for you. When in fact, if you can forgive and release and let them go and reconcile, doesn't matter what they do or what they say, so that God can promote you. So what am I dealing with? I'm dealing with a demon called self, the antichrist spirits that worship self, that says, I don't care about my brother. I don't care about my sister. I don't love this one. I don't even care if I offended them. It is about me. It's I want to be right. It's me, myself, and I. Me, what what does that song go? Uh, My way. Um, I want to have it my way. Uh, Some guy, okay. I want to have it my way. So, so, so that is how Christianity is not our way. It is I pick up my cross. I walk and I deny myself. I die to myself and I live for others. One person was sitting in front of us. We were counseling a couple. And uh, the one, the, the wife of this couple attacked my wife or said something, attacked them somewhere at a shop. And you know, a lot of people, it is very easy to like me but it is not easy maybe to like my wife. It's very easy to say, oh, the great prophet, he's the one that is teaching, you know. But how dare they? And, and, and they attacked her. And I had him in for counseling. And uh, you know, the lady has plastic surgery everywhere. So not even 22 years old, but plastic surgery everywhere. I'm not against plastic surgery at all. Not against it at all. Uh, but uh, I was making a point with it, with a, with a specific thing. I said, listen, I can get very crude, okay, when it is real. I'm not your pastor. 
if I sit and counsel you or deliver you. That is AFM, leaven of words. They'll be kind to you. I'll be very crude. I'll be like, listen, you got, uh, uh, I won't say the wording now for the sake of time, uh, for the sake of uh, live stream. I won't say what I said. I wasn't swearing, but I was straightforward. Because if you want to go that route and just attack a woman of God or a man of God, you're 20 years old. So I said, listen, you got this work, just uh, job done and you have this done to your face. You have done all these things and you look like a model in your own eyes. But have you ever won one soul to Jesus Christ? Have you ever changed anyone's life? Have you ever delivered anyone of demons? Have you ever counseled anyone? But you sit, you're cocky, you know, think the world owes you everything because you have money. I said, yet you can speak against servants of God like this and you have done nothing. Sometimes we can be so blinded by pride and self and we can just talk about people and we don't know that our tongue has been turned into a serpentine tongue, into a split tongue. The Bible says in James, it says the tongue is lit by the very fires of hell. Don't trust it. If there's one thing you must not trust, it is your heart here. I know there's a good saying, you know, trust your heart. No, don't trust your heart. The Bible says your heart is evil, deceitful, wicked above all else. Jeremiah chapter number 17 verse 19. So don't trust your heart. Trust the Holy Ghost. And don't trust your tongue because your tongue is lit by the very fires and flames from hell. When this thing goes loose, not under the control of the Holy Ghost, it is designed to speak evil and to steer your life to negativity. It is like the rudder of a ship, the Bible says in the book of James. It can cause your life to go left or cause your life to go right. What you speak will be your end result. God has given you creative ability in your tongue to utter your destiny, to speak your destiny. Why? You are made in the image of God and the likeness of God. And if God created by His mouth, He said, I will cause you to steer your life by your mouth. And salvation is you believe in your heart and confess. So if you confess with your mouth, stand to your feet wherever you are, stand to your feet. So what do I do? How do I listen to someone's heart? How do I listen to where they are at? I listen to what comes out of their mouth. Jesus says, your mouth is full. What your heart, your mouth overruns what your heart is full of. Are you guys with me? La rosca aredene meske tekeno maya. Maso de lebeska aleske evreke noske day. I want to have the presence of God to come and I want to pray for some that are here. I know that the Holy Spirit wants to set people free. Are you guys with me? Just wherever you are right now, I want you to close your eyes. Just raise your hands to the Lord. Close your eyes. Surrender to Him. It doesn't matter if somebody has abused you. It doesn't matter if somebody has done wrong against you. It, is, it, 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 it might not have even been your fault. It might have been without your consent. The thing is that if I hold on to that, I will be tormented. I, it is like drinking poison and hoping that person dies. That is what unforgiveness is. It blocks us in the call of God. It stops and hinders us from moving forward because of one act that was done against us or something that was done wrong against us. Listen here, in Christianity, if you get saved, welcome to being done things wrong against you. The Bible says you will not enter into the kingdom without sufferings, without persecutions. Meaning we enter the kingdom with many persecutions. But maybe you are here and you're saying, but even when I was a child, things were done against me. You see, it was wrong. It was very wrong. But the devil's plan was not that thing done against you. The devil's plan was for you to hold on to that and keep blaming that one. Because he knows if you do it, it is the original sin of Adam. 
and Eve where they said, but it's that one's fault, not my fault. I don't have today because this is what's been done to me in childhood. I don't have today because this is what others have done or business partners or family members has done against me. I don't have things and yes, I cannot progress and I cannot keep a job because you know, it's this one's fault, it's the boss's fault. No, no, no. The only way I can progress forward is to say, God, you have forgiven me of $10 million of debts in the Amplified Bible it says. You have forgiven me of so much debts. You have forgiven me of the debts of to be, to be destined to eternal separation from you. You have forgiven me from the debt and the power of sin. I should be forgiving somebody like this. Doesn't matter what they've done. I'm a new creation in Christ. And I know they've done it against me because they are blinded and they are not healed. And the only way I can be set free out of this prison, many people have found themselves in a prison. They found themselves in the prison of offense, in the jail of offense, where there's husbands, where there's wives standing here, where there's mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, where there is your brother in the kingdom that has done something against you or a sister in the kingdom that has done something against you, a friend, a business partner, your husband, your wife. It doesn't matter. It is a, this is not about them, it's about you. Are you with me? This is not about them, it is about you. And the only way you can win your brother and sister is that we will pray for you, but to actually go and reconcile to them. And I pray that the Spirit of God will work in the hearts of many that are here. I pray that the Holy Spirit, you see, when we don't allow the Holy Spirit to work in our hearts, God has to bring a purging. Or well, let me say it like this, God has to bring a pruning. What is a pruning? It means He cuts away some and bring new ones into the kingdom so the church can go further. Is this too, too hot? Don't be in a place where God don't need you. Be in a place where God can't do without you. Be in a place where He needs you. Be in a place where you love people so much that they need you. They, God needs you in their lives. Don't be dead wood in a church or in the kingdom where you have to be pruned. And I'm not speaking of hell, I'm speaking of being used. You pruned and you cut away so that God can bring new ones in. Never be in that place. Repent if you are in a place of dead wood. The Bible says dead wood are those ones that has been too long in the kingdom and they become, uh, they become familiar, they become hard, they become fested. And they can just sit around a miracle and not even be faced by it. They can sit around somebody receiving a breakthrough and no longer hungry. And God is saying, I'll bring a pruning so that new fresh ones can come in. That is actually hungry that will run for the call of God. I never want to be part of a pruning section. Every time I know a separation is coming or a pruning season is coming, I want to repent and say, God, if I have offended anyone, if I've slandered anyone, if I've spoken against anyone, if I've done my brother or my sister harm, I need to go and ask them to forgive me. I need to go reconcile to them before your presence departs from me. Because the most important thing is your presence. I don't want your presence to depart from my life. If there's anything that hinders your presence, you see many times we think we have the presence and we don't have the presence. You've got emotions. I'm going to say it again. A lot of times we think we have the presence. Well, God's hand has been lifted. And what we're feeling is chemicals in our brains and emotions. It's not the presence. The presence is a weight. The presence is a witness. It's an unction. It is the anointing that can break the yoke, the presence. Are you guys with me? Let the presence of the Lord never depart from my life. Let the presence of the Lord never depart from your life. Let the presence and the hand of God rest upon you. 
But you have to say, Lord, I want you to place me in the place where I, my heart is pure and humble towards every single person. I could have fallen into the trap of offense. I had brothers and sisters betraying me. I had people lie about me. We still have people lie about me. I can choose to hate them or I can choose to love them. Every day we have people writing articles. Even now they are watching. Some witches in the kingdom are watching right now, writing articles. Writing articles about how my wife dresses. Writing articles about what we are so-called doing or whatever. They are jealous. They are haters in the kingdom. But God places or uses them even to make you rise. I can choose to love them and forgive them or I can choose to be offended by them. I get sent the articles every day, but you know what? It doesn't bother me. I have gone way past that. We will be in two to three TV shows coming up now, even next month. Do you think it even bothers me? I can't wait to sit and watch a movie about myself. That's how I'm thinking about it. <laughs> this is the world. They will hate you. The Bible says they will persecute you. They will hate you. Unbelievers cannot understand what you are going through. So don't be offended if they come against you. Rejoice when you are persecuted. Rejoice when you go through trials and tribulations. And rejoice and be full of joy when fire comes against you. When you are persecuted for His name's sake. I'm not being persecuted for stealing money or having a scandal or committing adultery. We are being persecuted for His name's sake. How, what greater joy can there be to be on newspapers and on TV shows for His name's sake? If He's gone through it, how much more will you go through it? Don't be in a place of offense. God can use you so greatly. If you're out of that place, are you guys with me? Whether I offended you, somebody here offended you, whether your family offended you, your friends offended you. Let's break the power of that thing. This is where deliverance starts. You know, fear is upon people's lives because tormentors are there. Tormentors are there because of offense. Let's close our eyes wherever we are. Just close our eyes. Beruska alekenoske redredeske daye. Las onemaya. Las ekene vere bruske edele bera mambruske daye. Say with me, say Holy Spirit. Reveal to me any offense where I've been hurt, done wrong to. Allow me to forgive and reconcile. I commit to you, my spirit, my heart. No one will deter me. Offense will not distract me. And tonight, I pray for tormentors to leave me, torturers to leave me, humble me, and allow me to reconcile in Jesus' mighty name. I leave my gift at the altar and I first go make right with my brother and my sister. Say with me, shed the love of God abroad in my heart by the power of the Holy Spirit and make me a genuine believer to love others first. To love those who have hurt me, who have abused me, because I received your love. I received your forgiveness, your grace and your mercy in Jesus' mighty name. Right now, forgive me for any unforgiveness. As you're standing like this, just raise your hands to the Lord. Raise your hands to the Lord. Barosa ke evreke noske evreke dele bena maroska areke neske te yeske taya le roska aleke ne. I pray that tonight that any tormenting spirits, anything that has held you back, you see, even with these things, bondage comes, addictions comes, low self-esteem comes, 
all these things come to a person. But the thing is, that is the greatest thing that the enemy does. He brings delay upon your life. He brings a spirit of delay. And when you open your eyes, years are stolen from you because of offense. And I want to pray for every single person that is saying, you know what? This is the thing that has held me back. This is the thing that has held me back. I know that I have been offended or I have been having unforgiveness. Doesn't matter if it happened of abuse when I was young, when I was five or six years old, or if it happened when I was in school, or if it has happened when I'm in my marriage, by my husband or wife, it doesn't matter where it has happened, but I know that this thing has been in my heart and this thing has tripped me up or has delayed me from not being able to move forward. If that is you, as you have your hands raised, if that is you, if you're saying that is me, I want you just to wave your hands. I want you, I want to pray, I just want to, depending on how many people it is right now, raise your hands to the Lord high, raise your hands high. Holy Spirit, I pray, begin to move upon your people. Move upon your people. I really see him falling upon people right now. Maruska avrekeneske dele beras kuteyete na maya. Kelereske retenoske arekenaske dele be. Vosa vreske dele be na mambros kuteyete na maya. Baruska reke dele breka soke na mambros kuteya. Aruska avrekeneske dele be na maya. Baruska reke dele be na mambros kutele bayete na maya. Vera soke na mambros kutele baya. Baruska areke de le bena marus de na maya. Bresa ke na bruska re de le bena mambrus ke de le baya. Bera ha ke noska vera ke na bras ku de le bena maya. Bras ole ka nose ke de le bena mambrus ke de. Le randos ke ele ke na maya. Holy Spirit, I pray set your people free in so many areas. I pray right now, even as we pray, that you will come and enter upon their lives that you will enter into their lives. If you're saying you waved your hand, I want you to get to the front for me. Come and stand here in front that I can pray for you right now. Let's enter into worship.
heavens open up, mighty wind come breathe on us, revive us, Lord. Oh. Let us see your kingdom come, here right now your will be done, revive standing in front or if you have come forward for prayer you're not in front yet Holy Spirit I pray I pray for the anointing to destroy the yoke today let every root of bitterness be removed I pray that you will deposit light into them. That you'll deposit truth into them, freedom into them. Holy Spirit, let your weight fall in this place. Let your conviction fall in this place. Say with me, say Heavenly Father, forgive me. I receive your forgiveness. I release those that have hurt me. I will reconcile with them. Say with me, say, let the anointing, let your presence flow through me again. Use me for your glory. Every spirit of delay, I renounce it. Every spirit of fear, I renounce it. Every tormenting spirit, I renounce it. In Jesus' mighty name, I receive deliverance. I receive freedom. In Jesus' name, I walk in freedom. 
I walk in love, in brotherly love. I receive the washing power, the cleansing power of your blood in Jesus' mighty name. It will be final tonight. It will be concluded tonight. Fill me with your love, with your light. In Jesus' mighty name, I renounce the spirit of fear, tormenting spirits, any spirits of delay upon my life. Leave me. I cast you out. In Jesus' mighty name, let's worship, let's worship, let's worship.
just give Jesus a praise of Walk more free, walk pain free. In Jesus' name. Amen. As you walk back, it will be a sign that your family will be restored. That freedom will come. Your back will straighten. Your hip will straighten. In Jesus' mighty name. Come on, let's give a praise offering. Maso avredo noskete. Raise your hands, raise your hands, raise your hands. Brasco rede na ma. Where's the guys that does? Do we have ushers even that pray? And pray with her. Maroska avreke ke noskete ke na ma. Leroska areke de la breka noskete ere ma. I want her back to be straightened. Set her free, completely set her free. There you go, there you go, there you go. Out! Freedom comes in completely. Set her noska break and noska de lebe.
raise your hand. Say, Heavenly Father, I receive freedom completely. No offense, no walking in darkness. In Jesus' mighty name, I give you all the honor, the praise, and the glory. In Jesus' name. Come on, let's give a praise of friendship. you. We're going to see you at the leadership camp. Then see you Sunday morning. God bless you. If you would like to give into this ministry, we have made giving your tithes, seed, or offering as simple and effortless as possible. You can simply log on to encounterchurch.co.za or leondupria.com and click on the give button. Here we show you the different ways to give. It's so easy. You will find giving options for local or international giving. PayFast is a fast and secure way for South Africans to give. You can give once off or make a recurring donation. Here you will find the Zapper and SnapScan QR codes as a simple and effortless way to scan and give into the ministry. If you prefer to make an electronic transfer, the banking details of our various campuses and the Visionary Fund are also readily available. For giving internationally, Cash App is one of our fast and simple giving platforms. PayPal is another method for quick and easy giving internationally. You can use your PayPal account or you can give straight from your credit card. DonorBox is also available, which accepts a variety of international giving methods. For those who would like to take hands with us and become a part of the incredible work that God is doing, become a friend and partner of Encounter and Leon Dupria. We have many partnership tiers available to suit your preference. Our friends and partners receive exclusive materials from Leon Dupria, as well as private live streams and exclusive events. Thank you for being part of what God is doing.